It's my privilege this morning to begin this uh, sermon series on the book of First John. Seven weeks, this first week, the elders will be covering the book in seven messages. Uh, while Ken is ministering in St. Lucia and enjoying his vacation. So this morning we will briefly uh, be reviewing some of the background information of the letter and uh, highlighting some of maybe its major themes and then cover the first 12 verses, 1 verse 1 through 2, 2 together. So let's just dive in there and uh, get some background information out of the way. Well, the author, of course is John the Apostle, son of Zebedee, the younger brother of James, James and John. Uh, They were fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Following the call of Peter and Andrew, who were brothers and fishermen, Jesus called these two sons of Zebedee to follow him. You can find that in Matthew chapter 4, 18 through 22. Jesus referred to the pair uh, in Mark as sons of thunder, sons of thunder, It sounds neat, but the brothers, uh, when they were headed to Jerusalem and trying to make, get through a Samaritan town and they wouldn't receive Jesus, the brothers said, should we call down fire from heaven on them, you know, and (laughs) passionate for the Lord's uh, being the king. And yet the Lord rebuked them and said, the son of man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Aren't you glad for that? To save them. Uh, John lived more than half a century following the martyrdom of his brother James, who was the first apostle to die a martyr's death. Also, five times in the book of John, John refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. What a wonderful phrase. For example, at the Last Supper, he was right next to Christ, and Peter asked him to ask who was going to betray him. He was right there at his breast. So obviously, he had a very close relationship with the Savior. He was also one of the three, Peter, James, and John, uh, who were privileged to be with Jesus at certain times, special times, like the Transfiguration, where they were with him to see that glorious manifestation of the glory of Christ the King. So he was a privileged disciple as well as very close to the Savior. Um, Many commentators, scholars, uh, think of John's writings. Let's just talk about all of them toward the end of the first century. Probably the gospel written uh, 80 to 85 AD, wrote first and second and third John probably in the early 90s, and then the book of Revelation in AD 95 during the Domitian persecution. So, John's writings, then, are the last inspired books that uh, complete the New Testament canon. The New Testament canon. And uh, we'll see that uh, the issues, the battles being fought have not changed. Not in the first century, not in our century. The recipients. You notice when we start 1 John, you'll see it's not like other books that talk about a specific church being addressed. Uh, Although we do know that according to church tradition, John did minister at Ephesus, this has led many to the conclusion, and I think it's fair, that the letter was meant to be shared with a number of local congregations uh, that John was familiar with, Uh, So, which is why we don't have a specific church addressed. The purpose, John is very clear in the gospel and in in this uh, first epistle, Uh, He leaves no doubt concerning why he wrote this letter. We read in 1 John 5, 13, These things I have written to you who believe, believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. And uh, that's interesting, isn't it? In our day and age, if you believe, well, you've got eternal life, no problem. There's no question about it. But it's always been an issue. Is it real for you? How do you know you have eternal life? John wrote the book for that purpose. So it's a wonderful way to look at our own lives and see what's going on with us and the Savior. We're going to see in this letter as we move through it with the men that uh, knowing that you have eternal life is related to a number of important issues. Let me just hit a couple. First, first and foundationally, is the issue of the authoritative content of the gospel message concerning the person and work of Jesus Christ. Uh, This foundational truth was coming under attack 
in his day by false teachers, false brethren, who were authoritatively teaching heresy concerning the person of Christ that destroyed the truth of the gospel and nullified his saving cross work. But they're setting themselves up. The Spirit is giving me this message. And we'll see how that plays out. Second, these false brethren were claiming to have a genuine relationship with God that they spoke with the authority of the Holy Spirit when in fact John declares that only those who practice righteousness and cling to the truth of the message that was delivered to them uh, in the power of the Spirit are truly righteous, are truly saved. Okay. It's an issue always in the church. First of all, the enemy's always trying to undermine the truth of the beauty of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Is that true today? Yes, it was true then, it's true today. And second, he's always trying to undermine this glorious gospel that talks about lives being truly changed, not just some false profession. Hence, knowing that you have eternal life is related to both one's position in Christ by grace through faith in the true gospel message and one's practice of righteousness in the power of the indwelling Spirit of God. We're going to see the Spirit of God often in this book of 1 John. And as we move through the letter, we'll see that practicing righteousness involves loving God and the truth, loving the brethren, and obeying God out of love for God in this daily walk. All those things are going to be brought up to help us know if we have eternal life. So it's important, isn't it? It's important for us to study this book. So I think John writes with the passionate heart of a pastor, desiring to protect the sheep from the ravages of some very serious false teaching that is undermining both the person of Christ and his work. He addresses theological and ethical issues in an effort to shore up the faith of true believers so that they can know that their eternal life is certain and anchored in the great gospel truths that they were taught when the church was established and that they embraced by faith, okay? So I think uh, just by way of implication, John's letter is as vitally important to us today as it was to his readers in the first century. You know, in the modern professing church of Jesus Christ, there are many who do not have an accurate view of the biblical gospel because they are listening to men who set themselves up in positions of authority as teachers who don't know the gospel themselves. Men who don't speak of sin and righteousness and eternal judgment. They don't talk about our need for a propitiatory sacrifice to appease God's wrath against us. The Bible is simply a book of good moral principles, divine principles indeed, but designed to improve our lives and families and marriages. And if you do what it says, you're going to be blessed and have a right standing with God and be pleasing to Him. Many people are being told that today. Today. Some men will tell you that you can be saved from hell by sincerely agreeing with the truths of the gospel. And and, and God's grace means that no matter how you live, after this sincere experience, you'll be okay with God. In other words, one's position is secure no matter what your practice looks like. John would be appalled at these ideas. Appalled at these ideas. And you'll see that as we move through the book. Okay. So as we uh, conclude the introduction, then, it's important... One last thing I think that's really kind of wonderful about John, he, he not only had a passionate pastor's heart, but he had a fatherly heart. He was, here's this aged apostle, and he, he talks to these 
people, these dear saints, like little, my little children, he says. Um, he loves and cares for those the Lord has entrusted to him to shepherd. It reminds us of what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians. He says, well, you know, we're, we've proved to be gentle among you, like a, a nursing mother tenderly caring for her own children, having a fond affection for you. Uh, we impart our lives, not just the gospel. And this is the heart John had to the end of his life for these dear saints. And note from verse 4, we'll, we'll touch on it just again briefly later, but he writes, purpose, so that our joy, our joy may be made complete. He states in 3 John verse 4, I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in truth. John's greatest joy was not about himself, but he was caught up in the joy of knowing that others were walking close to Jesus. That, that should be reflected in the heart of a pastor desiring that for his people, desiring that for one another, one another. So, with this background in mind, let's begin to look at this marvelous letter. It's powerful. It's marvelous. And as we quickly, quickly move through these first 12 verses, we're going to see John bring up a number of key themes that are developed throughout the rest of the letter. And so let's take them three sections, verses 1 through 4, which is about the person of Christ, uh, verses 5 through 10, which is about the practice of the believer, a walking in light. And chapter 2, 1 and 2 is about Christ, our advocate. Th this is such a Christ-centered book, Christ-centered book. So, section 1, the person of Christ. Man, this is it. John begins his letter, as he begins, he immediately brings his reader's attention to this critical foundational issue of the gospel. And it's a gospel that I hope never gets old because it's about an infinitely beautiful and valuable person, Jesus himself, person of Jesus Christ. So let's read and then we'll talk about it a little bit. He says, what was from the beginning what we have heard what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested and what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. So these verses powerfully and authoritatively declare eternal truth concerning the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Brian read earlier, it's founded upon those great gospel truths at the beginning of the book of John. You can see that. What was from the beginning? John 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Concerning the Word of life. John 1, 4 and 5. In Him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. The darkness did not overpower it. Impossible. And then twice in verse 2. And the life was manifested. The eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. And again, we have from John 1, the Word was with God, separate but equal, with God. And the Word was God. And the Word became flesh, verse 14 of chapter 1, and dwelt among us, manifested to us. Manifested means, means to cause, to become visible, to reveal and we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1.18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him to us, shown Him to us. Like He said to Philip at the end, Philip, if you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. Manifested. 
And this is very important, powerful. Notice the first person eyewitness account language by John. Verse 1, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands. It reminds you of Thomas. You remember at the end of book John, the book of John, Thomas, touch my hands and my side and don't be unbelieving, but believing. Touch me. I'm a real, real person suffered and died, rose again. Verse 2, what we have seen, same phrases, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands. Verse 3, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you. We proclaim to you also. Eyewitness accounts. Jesus in Luke 26, 46 through 48 said to his disciples prior to his ascension, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. You men are eyewitnesses. You've heard and seen and touched and seen. Here I am, the resurrected Christ. Go proclaim it. They were, to, they were witnesses of his life and death and resurrection. When they replaced Judas, they had to have a man who was a witness of all those things because it was important. They are to go proclaim in the power of the Spirit this divine message received from the risen Christ to the nations. And dear people, this is the only message that has the authority of God behind it then and now. Then and now. Any other message? And believe me, there's a lot of messages out there today. You just don't walk into a church and hear this message. Any other message is a fraud, a counterfeit, false gospel that cannot save you. Remember what Paul said in Galatians? And I'm telling you, this message has authority. Once it was proclaimed by the Lord and given to these men, you can't change it. It has authority over the men proclaiming it. But even if we are an angel from heaven, Paul said, even if we, me, or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what, you have, what, what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. You remember how he called Peter on the carpet? The apostle Peter on the carpet? Peter, you're, you're drifting from the message. It has authority. And John is bringing it out because there are men here who are destroying the message, undermining the message. So this is why John starts the book the way he does. I hope you see that. False teachers were declaring that a Christ that did, a Christ, declaring a Christ that did not come in the flesh. 1 John 4, 2 and 3, we'll get to that. If that's true, this, of course, destroys the gospel because we have no real physical propitiatory substitute sacrifice for sins. There's no blood shed for you. He didn't come in the flesh. Wow. People were being confused and, because they're speaking with authority. Are there men speaking with authority today undermining this gospel message? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Now, here's an implication, though, for us. Um, let me make a point with respect to the gospel in a Bible church like Southside, here at Southside. We proclaim, I believe, <laughs> we proclaim the true gospel. Week in and week out. And the issue that John was combating is not an issue here. I don't think there's one person sitting in this room right now who would say that Jesus did not come in the flesh. Nobody would say that. If, you ha if that's true for you, come see me afterwards, please. We're going to have a discussion. Okay, but that's not the issue today. It was then. But here's the issue for us, people. 
there are many here who understand the truths of the gospel as they are proclaimed here week after week. You get it. And many of those who understand give hearty approval to these truths. I appro- yes, I agree with those truths. I approve of these truths. But I can tell you right now, understanding the truths of the gospel and approving of the truth, wholeheartedly approving of the truths of the gospel will not save you. What do you need besides understanding and approval? What do you need? You need saving faith. You need to be born again. You need to put your personal trust in this person who died on the cross as the Lamb. You need to embrace Him by faith as your sin bearer. It has to be personal. And that happens by grace through faith. Please, don't just sit here knowing and approving. Please embrace the Savior. And if you do, your life will be reflected by this book of 1 John. Does that make sense? Can people sit here and know and approve and be on their way to hell? Yes. We don't want that for anybody who walked in the door today. We want you to embrace him by faith. We find the purpose of this proclamation in verse 3, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Embracing the proclamation of the gospel with true saving faith brings you into what John says is fellowship with other believers, the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, this is important that you get this. This idea of fellowship for John is nothing less than salvation itself. It's about a genuine relationship with God. I think it's John's way of defining Jesus' comments given in his high priestly prayer in John 17, where he says that he he prays for all believers that they may be one, all one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you. They have fellowship and we're brought into that fellowship that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity in this unity, this fellowship, this union with the living God, so that the world knows that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. And he says that knowing God, he knows the Father and he's made the Father known to his disciples. You, you get it? This isn't just like having a bad day of not doing so good with fellow. This is about whether you have a genuine relationship with God Salvation is being brought into this eternal love relationship that has ever existed within the Godhead between the Father and the Son. This is the fellowship John is talking about. Genuine relationship with God. Being a Christian. Okay? Being a Christian. And that will be confirmed as we move through the book. It will be confirmed that it's nothing less than that. And then again, his perspective, so that our joy may be made complete. Okay, got to keep moving. Section 2. Section 2, 5 through 10. The practice of the believer walking in the light. In this section, John continues to highlight the significance of what it means to have genuine fellowship with God and Jesus Christ and other true believers. We're going to see a stark contrast. Man, this is just amazing how he does this. Back and forth, stark contrast between those who profess to have such a fellowship, but do not, and those who have a genuine love relationship with God through Christ. So let's read. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. That's the contrast. But let me just make a point. He uses the first person plural pronoun we because he's telling them it doesn't matter who you are, if you do this, if anyone does this, if someone does this, you lie and do not practice the truth. I don't care who you are. 
I don't care what rank you have, what prestige you have. John's saying, if anybody does this, that's why he uses we. If you walk in darkness, you don't have fellowship. You lie. Do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Relationship. And, get this, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Contrast. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. In verse 5, you saw that John stresses, I think, the absolute moral purity of God. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And of course, this is true of the Son as well. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, right? God is light. So why does John focus on that? Here's why I think. He does this to set up this contrast between true and false brethren as he begins to build his argument against these false teachers, false brothers, whose proclamation and practice, you will see, both stand in opposition to the truth John and his fellow eyewitnesses proclaimed to the churches concerning Christ's person and work when they were founded. Okay? He's setting it up. For someone to say that they have fellowship with God, as described in verse 3, and yet be walking in darkness, and by the way, John is not going to leave us in the dark. He's going to define what it means to walk in darkness, like in chapter 2, verse 9, the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in darkness until now. He's going to tell you what it means to walk in darkness. Okay? But if you're doing that, it proves them to be a liar and one who is not practicing the truth. By the way, that verb practicing is a big verb for John. Practice means the general tenor of your life, what you do. It doesn't mean perfection, because Christians, we're going to see, are not perfect, but they practice righteousness in their life because of the presence of the Spirit, New Covenant grace. Okay? So he talks about them not practicing the truth. So for John, a person's profession, what you say, and your position, and your practice must all sync up together so that you can know you have eternal life. If they don't, you could have a real problem. Got to sync up. To know, to confirm. In contrast to the liar with a false profession, we have the genuine believer in verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Jesus does the same thing in John chapter 3, this contrast, when he declares, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than light. doesn't matter what you say with your mouth. These men say we're walking in light, but they're not. They love the darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices, there's the same verb, practices the truth, comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. The marvelous reality for the child of God is that he walks in the light as God himself is in the light. John 8, 12, then Jesus said to his disciples, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Again, not perfection, but practice. Practice. And here, I love this, second, the second result, or the first result is then we have fellowship with one another because we're a family. We have this unity in Christ. And the second result is that the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Sin. People, this is a present tense verb. It means that for the believer, there is a constant cleansing from sin by the blood of Christ. Constantly. Isn't that great news? Constant cleansing from sin. In contrast, again, John, in reference to the false teachers in verse 8, says, 
we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. False teachers were downplaying the reality of sin in their heretical teaching and even denying that they had sin that needed to be covered by the physical blood of Christ. John Stott had some comments about this Gnostic heresy that somehow the flesh is bad, but the spirit is pure and good, and I have no sin in the spirit. I'm perfect. I have this knowledge. Sinful nature is eradicated because of the spiritual idea, so we don't need that blood. Wrong. Now in verse 9, he comes back to the truth for God's children. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This, I think this is marvelous because we've just heard that you're constantly covered by the blood of Christ. So in your daily walk, you're not going to be perfect, are you? In your walk with God. We're going to see that in chapter 2, the first two verses. But when you are made aware of sin in your life, uh, undoubtedly because of the presence of the Holy Spirit, you can confess your sins. And that's based on the promise of verse 7 that you're cleansed by the blood of Christ constantly. You can confess your sins and know that because God is faithful to His Word, to that promise in verse 7, and because He is righteous... He will forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Isn't that marvelous? You're covered. And when you sin, you're running back to the cross and you can claim that. And the Father is faithful to His Word and righteous and He cleanses you because of the blood of Christ. You don't have to go do anything else to get right with God. Cling to the promise. You cling to the cross. Back contrast now, verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. That's amazing. False brethren, he highlights the error. This is errors of their teaching. It's a powerful statement to say you're making God a liar by what you say. And it confirms that his word is not in them. That's not some Christian having trouble. That's a false brother. The gospel is about the exaltation of Christ as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is God's great plan of salvation to set His name on display, and they're standing against it, saying, I have the Spirit. They're void of truth. Though they, What do they profess? We, I have fellowship with God. They're being utterly deceived, thinking that they have that when they do not. What a terrible place to be. Wouldn't you agree with that? You don't want to be the one standing before Christ one day. Oh, Lord, Lord, and have him say, depart from me. I never knew you. You never loved me with a new heart. Wow, total deception. We don't want anybody to be deceived here. You have questions, you come and talk to us. Okay. How we doing? (laughs) Let's go to our last section. Man, I love this. Christ, our advocate. 1 John 2, 1 and 2. My little children, I'm, there you go, my little children. (laughs) Can you imagine sitting at the feet of this aged apostle? Oh, wow. I'm writing these things to you. Get this, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. John says that he is writing these things so that you may not sin. I think this comment by John reflects that he truly understood new covenant saving grace in the lives of people who are given that grace. He understood that those who have been recipients of such grace will not treat sin in a flippant manner, but will in fact have a heart to not sin against God. It's not how much can I sin and get away with it and get into heaven. It's not about that. You have a heart, you don't want to sin against God because you love Him. You have a love relationship with Him. You don't want to hinder that relationship. He did not expect a believer's life to be filled with sin because what does he say next? 
And if anyone sins. We're not talking perfection here, people. What John understood, the power of the Spirit to bring about a changed life. If anyone sins. That's amazing. MacArthur uh, stated this way. Being faithful, diligent confessors of sin as an expression of their new creation made it contrary to their disposition to abuse God's grace by indulging in further sin. John was writing these things to encourage them in consistent holiness because they were regenerate people indwelt by the Holy Spirit who had been delivered from habitual sin. And we don't have time to get into some of these great texts, but you remember Romans chapter 6, 1 and 2? What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. It's almost like impossible. Why? How shall we who died to sin still live in it? How shall we who have had the power of sin broken over us, no longer controlled by it, still live in it as under its control? You can't, it can't happen. So he says, if anyone sins. Do you get it? This is a powerful supernatural message, people. To us this morning. And this book is powerful. And I've had people come and ask me, I don't know if I'm saved, I take them right to this book. Let the Spirit and the Word sort it out for them. Okay. John concludes with a marvelous promise to God's children. Even though we don't want to sin, we will. We, we're going to sin. So he declares, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate, oh man, with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. <clears throat> and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not only for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Advocate means one who appears in another's behalf, a mediator, an intercessor, a helper. John Stott said it has reference to one who speaks to the Father in our defense. He's for you. Who can bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Christ Jesus intercedes for you in that courtroom, right? And our advocate, dear people, is Jesus Christ, the righteous one. This is the spotless Lamb of God who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in His mouth. This is the one who was tempted in every way, yet without sin. This is the only human being who has ever lived who could throw out the challenge to his enemies and say, which one of you accuses me of sin? And survive unscathed with no accusers. No accusers. This is the one the Father was pleased to crush. The righteous one, God's servant, who justifies the many by bearing their iniquities. He appeases the infinite wrath of God against all who are trusting in Him as their substitute sacrifice. And dear people, He's offered to the whole world, isn't He? <laughs> missions. The divine message of the gospel is for all mankind. You remember Acts 4.12? And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Oh, may he be yours today. If he is not, come to him. He pleads with you to come to him. Come to him and be saved. Be delivered from sin and death and the law. Put your faith in him as your sin bearer and your Lord and your God. There's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we, we marvel at who you are. All the songs we sang uh, this morning, 
that drew our attention to the beauty of Christ and your beauty seen through him, we just thank you. We thank you for a gospel message that declares to us from eyewitnesses who walked with you, Jesus, heard you speak, saw you die, witnesses to the resurrection who touched you and proclaimed these message, this message to us, who didn't see you, who didn't touch you, yet we have confidence that it's the true gospel message that cannot be tampered with. Thank you for bringing it home to our hearts by the power of the Spirit. If we know you today, we've been born again through seed which is imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God, this gospel. Thank you that it's a gospel that not only sets forth the beauty of Christ, but if it's embraced, it changes us from within. We're the recipients of this great new covenant grace. We have a a new heart, the Spirit of God within us, so that we don't want to sin. But if we do, Jesus, you're our advocate forever and ever. And we are covered constantly by your shed blood. Oh, what a great salvation we have. Dear Lord Jesus, touch our hearts today with this great truth. Cause us to reflect upon you this week and be refreshed by the truth. Don't let anyone in here buy into a false, foolish message that's less than this beautiful, absolute truth we've heard today from your word. In your name we pray and thank you for this time. Amen, dear Lord Jesus. Amen.